Okay, let's uh, get started. I forgot to bring the attendance sheet for today. That means that everybody is by default present. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the assignments. Undergraduates, you're working through uh, assignment nine, which is the genetic algorithm. Uh, main difference between the genetic algorithm and all the other optimization methods we've seen so far is the higher your fitness relative to the fitness of all the other robots in the population, the more likely you are to produce more offspring, right? Okay. Um, you will be starting in on assignment 10 next Tuesday, the 10th and final uh, assignment, where you will now be evaluating every robot multiple times in multiple environments, and you're going to be evolving your quadruped to produce the behavior phototaxis. Graduate students, you're working your way through your weekly deliverables leading up to your final project. Any questions about that? Okay, a little bit about uh, the schedule. Um, I am leaving to uh, um, attend a few meetings on the West Coast and the East Coast for the rest of this week, so I will not be here for Thursday's class. We will have a guest lecturer, Sam Kriegman. Sam is sitting in the back there. Uh, so this is a special situation where we have a student who's also going to serve as the instructor for one day. Uh, Sam is one of my PhD students, and he's working on evolving soft robots, and he's going to walk you through uh, one of his recent papers uh, on Thursday. I will be visiting San Francisco and Washington, D.C. My rule is I always bring back uh, some food to bribe you with, so I will uh, bring back something good to eat on next Tuesday. Okay, so um, we're working our way through this section on open challenges in the field of evolutionary robotics. We looked at uh, modularity, and again, there's no good answer to this yet, but there are attempts to try and allow evolution to evolve robots that can themselves break down their challenges into bite-sized chunks. Uh, we almost finished lecture 14 last time where we were looking at two different algorithms, NEAT and HyperNEAT. What, were, what was NEAT, what was the problem that NEAT was designed to solve? We're looking at open problems, open challenges in the field. That's what every optimization method or every evolutionary algorithm is designed to do. Sorry? Increase the probability of that. Increase the probability that the child will be better than, what did you say? The parent. The parent, not singular, but plural. Parents by like cutting them in half and gluing them together. Exactly, right? So what's the problem there? Why don't we just cut them in half and glue them together? What's the, specific, what's the name of that specific problem? Oh, I remember you kept saying it. That's the intuition, right? That's pretty much what happens if you cut two neural networks in half and glue them together. What was the name of this open challenge in the field? Which NEAT deals with pretty well. It's probably not the last word on this problem. Why can't you cut a PC and Mac in half and glue the two halves together? They're not compatible, They're not compatible right? So this was... If we go back to lecture 14 for a moment, this was the competing conventions problem, right? If in our population we have two neural networks that, all, that are almost there, they're doing pretty well, um, and we would like, uh, assuming that these two neural networks have solved two of the problems, so perhaps uh, this network is pretty good at solving A, but not so good at B and C, this one is pretty good at solving B and C, but not so good at A. We would love to cut um, in some way in which we grab A from the first network and B and C from the second network and bring them together, right? That's why Mother Nature invented sex in the first place. It's a way to try and bring together the best of both worlds. The problem is that subproblems may show up in different places in different neural networks, right? So we want to try and create a way to uh, combine these. And I won't go through the details, but that's what NEAT was designed uh, to do. Then we looked at HyperNEAT, which builds on top of NEAT. What, is, what does HyperNEAT do? What was so unique about HyperNEAT compared to all the other evolutionary algorithms we've seen so far? It 
into the algorithm, right? So you're feeding into the input of those special neural networks in hypernate, and those special neural networks are evolved by neat. Those special neural networks take coordinates as input. Why? Why were why does hyperneat do that? Let's say we have a neural network inside of a robot, and we're going to, as usual, evolve that robot to locomote or pick up an object. We're going to take a second neural network, which is the special neural network evolved by hyperneat. We're going to feed in the coordinates of each synapse in the neural network inside of the robot. We're going to take the coordinate of each synapse and put it into the input of this other neural network. What do we do with the output of this other network? Set the weights of the, Set the, weights of the synapse, right? So a CPPN, which are these special neural, neural networks in hypernet, take coordinates as input, and then they paint something onto that, whatever exists at that coordinate, right? I tried to help you build up an intuition for hyperlead last time by showing you how we could walk across the pixels in an image and paint colors onto the pixels using a CPPN. And what did we tend to get? We didn't get white noise. We didn't get random patterns. What kind of patterns did we get? Things that were symmetric or had some sort of regular, some sort of regular pattern to them, right? So there's this little cartoon of this insect over here, right? So we're drawing perhaps a picture into the plane, and insects and most other organisms are not random collections of cells, right? There's lots of regularity in biological organisms, right? Some of us have repeating segments. Uh, most of us are symmetric, so this insect and humans are bilaterally symmetric, at least the outsides of our bodies. The left side looks exactly the same as the right side. Right? If we were to try, and so in the same way, hypernet takes a neural network like this one, which is embedded in three dimensions, and paints regular patterns of synaptic weights across this neural network. Right? So in your assignment, when you've got your four by eight, uh, when you've got your, sorry, your four sensor neurons and your eight motor neurons and you've got those 32 synapses, you're just evolving each synapse independently, right? They're not really related to one another. So you'll get a random pattern of weights, which as you've probably seen, causes your quadruped to sort of thrash all over the place. Last time we ended by looking at a video of, uh, of a quadruped using this neural network, and we saw that the quadruped tends to move all four legs in phase together. So we saw that a CPPN from hypernet tends to paint regular gradients of synaptic weight across a neural network, and that regular pattern of weights tends to produce regular movement in time in the, in the robot. That's why hyperneat is useful. So hyperneat solves a particular problem, which is we would like to bias hyperneat, we would like to bias evolution to search the space of all possible neural networks, but we want to bias it to search for neural networks that tend to have regular patterns inside of them, right? Not just random collections of Synaptic weights. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna finish off lecture fourteen in a moment now. Um, yesterday I taped uh, my office hours where I've been working my way through some other evolutionary algorithms. These are completely optional. Um, you can go and have a look if you like. I tackled a particular problem in office hours yesterday, which is evolving robots that are fit, meaning they move quickly, and they're also selected to be unique meaning they, that for a particular robot, it moves much more differently than all the other robots in the population. As you're implementing your genetic algorithm in assignment nine uh, this week, you will probably notice that when you run your genetic algorithm, it very quickly converges onto robots that move in very similar ways. So a big challenge in evolutionary computation 
is not only evolving things to do what you want, which in our case are robots that move quickly, we also want to actively try and maintain diversity in the population. We would like to have robots that move in lots of different ways. So one way to do that is to select robots to uh, produce offspring, not just based on their speed, but also based on how uniquely they move relative to the other robots in the population. If you're interested in that, you can go, go watch me code that up. Okay. We, uh, when we finish lecture 14, in a minute or two, we're going to switch to probably the biggest open problem uh, in the field, which is crossing the reality gap, right? So if I were to go to, Am uh, go to Amazon and buy one of these robot spider kits for you, there are these little quadrupeds that you can buy now online and give you one of these quadrupeds and give you instructions for how to take one of your evolved quadruped neural networks and download it onto the physical quadruped, how well do you think the physical quadruped would do at replicating the evolved gate you saw in simulation? Horrible, right? Why? Because it doesn't have exactly the motors and lengths and weights and all the stuff that our ideal world has. Absolutely, right? So the ideal simulation, one of the legs is a perfect cylinder. It's got a perfect uniform mass distribution along its, le its length. The motors are pretty strong in your simulation, probably stronger than the weak motors you would get in a robot kit. There's a lot of differences between any given physical robot and a simulation of it. So how do we actually do that? How do we take a controller from simulation and transfer it successfully to reality. We're going to look at one, two, three, four different attempts uh, to do this organized in time. We're going to start with the noise hypothesis from the 90s, the Golem project from 2000, the Resilient Machines project from 2006, and the transferability project from a couple years ago. So again, these are all good attempts to try and solve it. Nobody solved it perfectly uh, yet. Okay, so let's jump back to lecture 14 now, neat uh, and hyper-neat. We saw last time that hyper-neat tends to produce quadrupeds that move with a regular pattern. And again, if you've watched your quadruped enough now, you'll realize that obviously random thrashing even if it's moving in the right direction, will not get the, the quadruped to travel as far as a quadruped in which all the legs are moving together, or two of the legs move together and the other two move in perfect antiphase. You want to get some clean oscillation in the way that the legs are moving, and you want them to move together. That tends to produce faster moving quadrupeds. Um, they compare that to a control case which they called fixed topology NEAT. So in the control case, they took this neural network, they fixed the topology, meaning that they wired up all of these to all of these, they wired up each of these hidden neurons to every other hidden neuron and itself, and every one of these hidden neurons to each of the 12 motor neurons and fixed that topology, FT, and then evolved the weights of this neural network, not using hypernate, just in the standard way. And that tended to produce robots in which the legs were not very coordinated and those robots moved much slower. So this complex algorithm that I walked you through last time, hypernate, it's worth going to the effort of implementing it because it biases evolution to produce neural networks that have regular gradients of synaptic weights across the neural network, which produces robots that exhibit cleaner gates. Okay, here's a better way to, to see this here. These are two different robots that were evolved with hyperneat. We're looking at time steps here, so the horizontal axis is the lifetime of the robot, not evolutionary time, right? So here's one robot moving, and then here's a second robot moving, you can see if you look carefully that there are one, two, three, four curves. Why four curves? The, the legs, right? So more specifically, it's the hip forward and back uh, joint angle at the, the two back hips and the two front shoulders, if you like. 
How is this robot moving? Regularly. This is pronking. So if you remember Pepe Le Pew from uh, the Looney Tunes cartoons, all four legs move together, right? That's pronking. This one is not quite pronking. The legs are sort of somewhat uh, out of phase, but they're all doing more or less the same thing, right? So this, the top right one is actually closer to galloping. So if you watch a horse in which all the four legs are almost, or all four feet are almost hitting the ground at the same time, but not quite, that's galloping, right? Here are two of the best gates produced, two of the best robots produced by this fixed topology knee. When we don't use hyper knee, what's happening now? Who knows, right? Probably pretty much what your quadruped is doing, sort of thrashing all over the place. There's no real clear oscillation, a bit of an oscillation, but it's not very clean. Okay, um, there's two more slides in this lecture. We're going to skip the, la the last one here, 15, but I do want to show you this one. This one is really interesting. Again, we've got results from the hyperneed experiment and results from the control case where everything was the same except they took out hyperneed. Horizontal axis is now reporting generations, so we know that now we're looking at evolutionary time on the horizontal axis here. Each dot now is uh, an offspring that was produced through mutation. So hypernet allows mutation and crossover. We're just going to focus on the offspring that were produced by mutation. One parent produces one mutant. The dot represents the mutant, and the height of the dot represents the relative fitness of the offspring the fitness of the offspring relative to the parent, what do you think a negative y value represents? Worse, and a positive y value represents better. The offspring did better than the parent. Obviously, something is going on very differently in these two experiments. We'll set that aside for the moment. Let's build up an intuition for what's going on here. You can see in both of them most offspring, or a lot of offspring, tend to be more worse than the parent as evolution proceeds in both cases. Why is that? At the beginning, in the first few generations, yes, there are some offspring that are worse than the parent, but not by very much. And later on, there are many more offspring that are much worse than the parents. So it's like you said before, when you combine things, it's less likely to work. It's less likely to work, and we're not combining things here. We're just looking at mutants, right? We've actually set aside the recombination for a moment. These are just one mutant from one parent. Absolutely, right? So remember, over evolutionary time, the parents, the ones that qualify to produce offspring, are becoming more and more fit. The better and better you are, the more likely that when we produce a random mutation into a copy of you, it's going to be much, much worse. If I open up your laptop and start messing around with a couple of wires, I'm likely to break your laptop. If you throw together a random collection of electronics, and if by some wild chance it actually does anything, and I play with a couple wires in there, it's not going to make too much of a difference one way or the other. Right? Okay, so this pattern is what we would expect to see. What about the spread here? So obviously in, in the control case, um, most of the mutants are worse than the parents, and actually that's true here as well, right? Again, random mutation, most of the time it's likely to break things. But everything that's above, the, above zero here are mutants that are better than the parents. Why is there such a larger spread in the case of hyperneat than neat? This one takes a little bit of thinking about. A mutant produced in the hyperneat situation is likely to be much better or much worse than the parent. Because it's propagating and it has more drastic effects on the uh, Absolutely, right? So let's go back to a picture here where we're feeding in the inputs 
A mutation here, remember that in hypernet we're evolving CPPNs, neural networks that take coordinates as inputs. If, I, if, for example, let's imagine that this CPPN paints this picture into this two-dimensional plane, what do you think would happen to this picture if I mutate, for example, this synaptic weight? I've made one change to the genome, one small change. What do you think happens to the picture? A lot, right? So it's not that making a change here is only going to have a, a change here in the picture. Remember that this thing is painting every single pixel, so the whole picture is going to change in some way. It's not really clear how. Think about the neural networks that you're evolving. You have a matrix of four by, uh, four by eight matrix. You make one change to one synapse, that's it, right? You've made one change to that, that synapse. Here we're making one change to a synapse, which then, if we make one change to the CPPN, that might change all of the synaptic weights in this neural network, because the CPPN is painting synaptic weights onto this one, right? So that's why there's a much greater spread in the mutants produced by hypernet than FTNet. However, this part of the picture is really puzzling because we can now see from the spread that a mutation to a CPPN has a big effect on the neural network controlling the robot. And I've mentioned several times that if I went into your laptop with tweezers and randomly made a change, probably still likely to break something. But I'm much more likely to break something if I come in with a sledgehammer and make a big change to a lot of things is exactly what happens to the mutants of hypernet. If that's true, how is this sledgehammer compared to this tweezers? How is the sledgehammer ten sometimes producing, quite a bit of the time actually, mutants that are much better than the parents? So this, this example I'm giving you about the tweezers and the sledgehammer, this metaphor is breaking down now. Well, how? Along the lines of that, if you're, you have a big machine you can get rid of a lot of junk with a sledgehammer, and you can get rid of a lot of junk with tweezers. Exactly, you got it. So remember that we have our CPPN, which is painting synaptic weights into here. A mutation to one piece of the CPPN is going to make a change to a lot of synaptic weights here, but that change might be cleaning something up or um, enhancing some regular pattern across this neural network that's useful, so sort of turning up the gain of something that's useful. It's not random change, right? It's non-random change, but it's global change across the whole, the whole system. So this is one of the beautiful things about hyperneat, is it allows you to make big changes. It allows evolution to make big changes through the mutation to just one piece of the CPPN. But those big changes are not like a sledgehammer. They're like going in and cleaning up uh, an entire thing, or, or cleaning up some mistake, or enhancing some useful pattern across the whole the whole system. Okay, so even in hypernet, the average fitness change for all mutants is worse. Most of the time, it's still the sledgehammer. One change to the CPPN mucks up a big piece, or all of the neural network controlling the robot. But who cares, right? These mutants are going to die off anyways. All we're really interested in are the mutants that are able to do better than the parents. This is the raw material that's going to allow evolution to make progress. If you look at all the points above this line, there's relatively little of them, and they make relatively small increases. Right? So hypernet is, giving, is putting a lot of gasoline in the tank of evolution so it can keep going and make faster and faster robots. Okay, actually, I take it back. Let's actually have a look at slide 15 now that we've gone to all this, this effort. The last slide showed um, what was the fate of mutants of hypernet. This plot shows what is the fate of offspring of two parents of hypernet and not. So um, again, we've got evolutionary time along here. We've got six curves that we're going to work our way through. Let's have a look at the solid three lines now, which are the offspring produced by hypernate. 
We can see that, uh, let's see, let's start with uh, the light green line here. So this reports the fraction of all offspring that were worse than both parents, offspring below the parents. Relatively few of them, so there are relatively few offspring, about 15%, that when you took two parents, two CPPNs, and neat, recombine them into a new CPPN, that CPPN painted a robot neural network that was worse than either of the two parents. That happened relatively rarely. Red here, the big one, shows that more than half of the offspring had a fitness that was between both parents. Okay? That's good news. That's what we would expect. That's telling us that NEAT is working. We're taking two parents, we're re sexually recombining them, and the child is similar to the parents. It might be better, the offspring might have fitness better than one parent and worse than the, the other quite a bit of the time. The one we're really interested in, however, is the purple line, which is showing us that almost 30% of the offspring are better than either parents, right? This is really why we've gone to all this, this effort. We can now evolve two neural networks and combine them, and from time to time, almost 30% of the time, we get offspring that combine the best of both worlds. They happen just through this recombination event to bring together good genetic material from two different parents. Okay, let's look at the three dotted lines. So this is in the control case when we're not using NEAT, uh, or sorry, we are using NEAT, but we're uh, not using HyperNeat here. So let's have a look at, uh, let's see, let's do the same thing. Um, below the parents is the light, uh, the light green line here, dotted line, and we can see that there are many more offspring that are worse than both parents in FT neat compared to hyper neat. Right? So things are not working too well here. Uh, X, again, there are less offspring that are between both parents, and finally we're looking at the naked dotted line here. Um, which is showing the offspring above two parents, which is actually about the same as hyperneat. That's a little non-intuitive here. But generally speaking, hyperneat is tending, the result of recombination is doing better for hyperneat. There are many more offspring that are somewhere, that are similar to the parents, and in some case better than, than both. Okay. Any questions about NEAT or hyper-NEAT before we change gears? Okay, so now we're going to switch to, again, the biggest, arguably the biggest challenge in the field, which is crossing the reality gap. And let's start with the radical envelope of noise hypothesis, lecture 15. Okay, this was published way back in 1997 uh, when things were just uh, getting started in evolutionary robotics. There was an observation even back then they didn't have physics engines in 1997. Most people that were working in this field made their own relatively simple two-dimensional sort of physics engines. They were very simple affairs. Um, and especially in those simple simulations, they were noticing that the evolved robots would exploit details of the simulation. Perhaps you make a two-dimensional simulation, you don't put in any momentum, meaning that if your robot is traveling fast, and suddenly the neural network stops the wheels, the robot stops instantaneously. If you have a, we a real wheeled robot, and it's traveling quickly, that physical wheeled robot is not going to stop immediately, right? It'll slide or move a little bit because of momentum. So maybe evolution will exploit the fact that there's no momentum. It'll have the robot go fast, suddenly stop, turn 90 degrees, and move to the left, right? It's exploiting the fact that you forgot or you didn't put momentum into your physics engine, right? So if those details do not exist in reality, this lack of momentum, then obviously the controller is going to fail to cross the reality gap. If you took that robot and put it in a physical wheeled robot, the physical robot went fast and then tried to turn left, maybe it would flip over because of uh, sort of inertia and momentum, right? Okay, so... 
The hypothesis back then is let's not necessarily put momentum into the physics engine because that's a hard thing to do. Let's instead be a little bit lazy and we'll just put some noise in the simulator that will force evolution to create more robust controllers. So let's say we put some noise in there that whenever the wheels change speed, the, ro the robot changes speed randomly. It slows down a little bit faster or it slows down slow. Whenever it slams on the brakes, the robot comes to a halt at different times. Right? We don't have to simulate momentum. We just sort of put some noise in there in terms of the speed of the wheels and the speed of the robot. So now evolution can't exploit the fact that there's no momentum in your simulator and it can't evolve or it won't evolve a neural network that makes the robot go, right? Because it can't rely on the fact that the robot will stop on a dime because there's noise in the way in which the robot slows and comes to a halt. Make sense? All right, that's the basic intuition behind this very fancily named uh, hypothesis. Okay, but that question, that hypothesis brings up a lot of questions, right? What aspects of the simulation do we noisify? So they coined a new verb here, noisification. Especially if the simulation is complex, uh, many things must be noisified, right? So again, this was pre-physics engine era, but three years later when physics engines were invented, and we're using them now, what do we put noise on? Do we put it on friction, mass distribution, geometry, joint properties, sensor properties, motor properties? Where does it all, where does it all end, right? Okay, so the solution back then was to say, let's just make the simulation as simple as possible, and then there'll be relatively few details that we need to uh, noisify. So a minimal simulation is exactly that, right? Re you remember our, the, we looked at the, exper the minimal cognition experiments with the little Space Invaders robot moving back and forth along the bottom of the screen. This is sort of in the same spirit. Let's keep the simulation as simple as possible because we're going to actually transfer some of these controllers to the real world. Okay, this is a screenshot from the Resilient Machines Project, which we're going to see in Lecture 17. Here's a snapshots from an evolved gait of the quadruped we used in that experiment. Here's screenshots of a controller, that the evolved controller when it was transferred to the physical robot. As you'll see in lecture 17, we went to a lot of effort to make sure this evolved controller crosses the reality gap. But even this controller, which does a pretty good job of crossing the gap, you can see that the physical robot is doing pretty much what the simulated robot does for most of the gait. But even there are certain points in the gait where the physical robot is doing something different. Luckily, that hiccup wasn't enough to derail the physical robot. So even in this case, we didn't cross the reality gap perfectly. It's just to sort of show you a snapshot of why this is so challenging. Okay, so let's come back to the radical noise of envelope of noise hypothesis. They broke down their simulator into two sets of details, the base set and the implementation set. So the base set were those aspects of the simulation that were going to be more or less correct. They were going to exist in the physical world uh, as well. They had some basis in reality, and we'll see some of those in a moment. Then there were other implementation details that had no basis in reality. There was some detail of the physics engine that's completely different from what would exist in reality. And I'll show you examples of those in a moment. They added a little bit of noise to the base set. So things that, were, that existed in the simulation and existed in reality, they noisified those a little bit. And things that they knew were just an artifact of the simulation, 100% noise. So that evolved controllers could not rely on them whatsoever, right? They're kind of there, but the 100% noisification was a way for the investigator to say, evolution, don't even, don't look behind the curtain. Don't worry about what's going on here. Do not rely on this detail when you're evolving controllers. Okay. This robot should look pretty familiar to you. Uh, they use the Kepra robot, so we've got our two uh, wheels here. We've got 
uh, six, seven, seven, eight uh, infrared sensors. Infrared sensors give distance information. So you can think of these as these eight rays emanating out from the Kepra robot. And we have two ambient, sorry, this should say ambient light sensors. So two photo sensors, one on either side of the robot. So 10 sensors, two uh, motors, left and right wheel. Here's the task. This is an interesting task, which was actually borrowed from psychology experiments. Um, yeah, this is the, the T task here. Um, we have our robot that is traveling up the stem of a T. And as it's moving up the stem of the T, it, there's either a flashlight that is going to flash it from the right or from the left. It doesn't know beforehand. The flashlight is going to flash. The robot is going to keep traveling. It can no longer see the light. And when it gets to the junction, what should it do? Turn right. It's supposed to turn in the direction uh, of the light. So this is a task that was designed to test animals to see whether they're capable of memory. So uh, rats and other animals were put in a tea maze like this, and they were conditioned so that they received a food reward if they actually turned down the right corner of the tea, the correct corner of the tea. If they turn down the corner, that's the same side as the light. Light flashed on the right, the rat turned to the right. If the light flashed on the left, the rat would move to the left. If the rat didn't do that, it just wouldn't receive some food at the end of its travel. Okay. If you think about this carefully, and this is a good test for students of embodied cognition, there is a way actually to solve this task without requiring memory. So they're going to obviously evolve the Kepra robot to do the same thing. Remember that the Kepra has ambient sensors on the left and the right. So the sensor can pick up the light on either the right or the left, keeps going. By the time it gets to the intersection of the T, both ambient light sensors are maximally low. It no longer sees the light, and the Kepra turns in the correct direction. If we wanted the Kepra to solve this problem with memory, what would we have to build into the neural network? Recurrent connections, right? And I think if I skip ahead here somewhere, here's a picture of the neural network. They did put recurrent connections in here. So the Kepra robot can indeed solve this problem with memory. Turns out, though, if you think carefully about the body of this robot and the environment in which it exists, you can solve this task without memory. Would it have just turned right right when you saw the light and what if it gets so long that it's really hard to get away? Absolutely, right? So um, if you've ever taken a handkerchief and tied a knot in it, right? There's something that you're carrying around with you to remind you that you need to do something later in time. The robot and actually the organism can do the same thing, right? The moment you see the light, you move towards the light so that one wall is closer to you than the other. Follow that wall, and when you get to the intersection, turn in the direction of whichever wall is closer to you. Okay. We'll just set that aside. It's not really important for this, for this experiment. Okay. So how do we evolve robots to do this? Um, we look to see how far the robot travels up the stem of the T, which is distance one. And then we see how far the robot travels down either uh, of the tops of the T, which is D2. If it happened to turn and move in the correct direction, it gets an additional 100 points. So by putting D1 and D2 in the fitness function, we're rewarding the robot for traveling up the T and making some decision at the top. doesn't matter left or right. So get some points for D2. If you made the right decision, you get these extra 100 points. Points. Okay, this is not actually the simulation they use. They use this simulation here, which looks a little bit strange. They have two, actually, they have two separate simulations. This one, an infinitely long corridor. This is phase one, which is meant to be the stem of the T. Here's the light zone here. If the robot travels far enough up uh, this uh, this tunnel that it gets to the intersection it is magically transported here so that now it is sitting 
inside the intersection, inside the intersection of the T, and behind it is this noise zone. Why, why create this ridiculously seeming simulation? Why not just use the T? We would use the light from behind it to signal it again. Possibly. Remember that this robot has uh, eight infrared sensors, which send out an infrared signal. In the physical robot, these infrared sensors send out an infrared signal, and then based on the reflection of that signal, the robot can infer or the time that it takes for the signal to come back. The robot can infer distance, right? How far away is an obstacle? Why do they throw away the intersection altogether and just have the two separate parts of the T? They have to simulate these infrared sensors. They're tricky to, they're tricky to uh, simulate. It turns out that if you try and simulate infrared beams that are bouncing around in this relatively complex environment, very, very difficult to do. And if you don't get it exactly right, the evolution is going to exploit those inaccuracies. So they basically, what you're going to see in a moment is they put 100% noise on any beams, any infrared beams that enter the noise zone here. So in essence, the investigators are telling evolution do not trust the infrared sensors when you're in this kind of environment. Do whatever you do, but don't rely on your infrared sensors at that time. Use your recurrent connections. Remember whatever you need to do. You can't trust whatever your sensor values are telling you in that situation. OK. This was a really, really minimal simulation. They really didn't even have any physics in here whatsoever. They actually just had two lookup tables. So the two lookup tables were as follows. Um, they would take the robot's current orientation, which direction was it, um, uh, which, which direction was it facing, take the values that are arriving at the two motor sensors, which is the direction the robot is trying to move in, and update the robot's new x and y position. So move the robot, right? So you're actually using a lookup table to look up the current orientation of the robot and the two values arriving at the neural network. You take those three values, you go to some lookup table, and those three values are associated with a delta x and a delta y saying what's the new position of the robot. Okay. They then had a lookup table also for the infrared sensor. So they said, let's take the robot's orientation theta and the distance. Here's, here's the orientation of the robot theta. And the distance from that, the front of the robot to the wall. And then how long is the line segment from the infrared sensor to the wall? Convert, convert the length to a sensor value. So there's sort of a lookup table, given the robot's current orientation, and where is it relative to the walls around it, and it, the lookup table would then give you back eight numbers, the eight values of these sensors. They're simulating the sensors in a lookup table. Very, very minimal simulation. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at the base set now, which is sort of things that are going to be more or less true in reality. Um, how the robot moves in response to motor signals. This is a pretty simple robot. So they knew that if left motor and right motor get 0.3 and 0.8, they know more or less what the new position of the robot is going to be. That's what they put in lookup table number one. They put about 10% noise on that. So when they got the new position of the robot back from that lookup table, they put a little bit of noise on those new values. So the new position of the robot was not quite what it should be, according to the lookup table. How the IR sensors respond, they put a little bit of noise on that. So when the infrared beam came back, that value, they put a little bit of noise on there. How the ambient light sensors respond, that they put a little bit. Uh, of noise on, and I, as you can probably guess by now, the implementation set, things that they knew they couldn't get right no matter what they did, 
uh, was how the infrared sensors behave when the robot is in the T-junction. So when the robot is in the T-junction, it sends out these beams, and that lookup table number two is supposed to give back values of the infrared sensors. The lookup table would just give back completely random values. Some other things they did, which we actually saw in the passive dynamic walker experiment, is they also put some noise just for fun. These guys really like to noiseify their simulators. They put some noise on which side did the light come from. That's important when we're evolving the robot. It can't know or exploit which side the flashlight's going to be on. So sometimes it was on the right, sometimes on the left. The width of the corridor would sometimes be narrower or wider. When they put the robot at the bottom of the stem of the T, they would put it, um, zero was facing directly up the stem of the T. Sometimes it was pointed a little bit to the left. Sometimes it was pointed a little bit to the right. The length of the noise zone, so this was actually a hole in the wall through which they would shine the flashlight. Sometimes that hole was a little bit longer, sometimes it was a little bit shorter. The actual length of the stem of the T, that was also uh, changed a little bit. So when they were evolving these robots in this minimal simulation, this simulation is pretty simple, they, so they could simulate it really fast, even back in 1997. And any time the robot tried to do its thing with an evolved controller, it was experiencing a slightly different environment. All right, we already said, I already pointed out that there are some recurrent connections here. Um, they imposed a little bit of bilateral symmetry. So again, we've seen this before. They cheated a little bit by building in a little bit of the structure of the neural network and allowing the rest to evolve. So they, they imposed bilateral symmetry, which now we have hyperneat, which should do it for us automatically if it's useful. Solid arrows, they said, were excitatory connections. Evolution could still evolve the weights of these excitatory connections, but they had to be positive. They forced inhibitory links, which were these, which, again, evolution could evolve the weights, but they had to be negative. They had to be inhibitory. And the numbers, are, the numbers were just evolved. Those were the activation thresholds. Let's have a look for a moment at these two inhibitory connections. If you look at biological nervous systems, you see a lot of mutual inhibition, which is what you're looking at here. This neuron inhibits this neuron, and this neuron in turn inhibits this neuron. Why, what is so great about mutual inhibition? Why is it useful in this task? Let's say the flashlight is here on the right which means ambient 5 is a little bit higher, is firing a little bit more strongly than ambient 0. Um, could it be to like reduce uh, the pickup of like light reflecting the other side of the board? Exactly, right? So the flashlight is on the right, but maybe it's also reflecting off, off the left. And the robot's not quite clear. It says, wait a second, I'm not quite sure is there more light on the right or the left. Mutual inhibition sort of exaggerates any slight difference, right? So it's, a, it's the robot's brain trying to clarify which side it's on, right? Um, if you've ever seen an older person and their sight is going, they're kind of like winking and blinking. They're doing the same thing, but now physiologically. If you ever watch a dog and it cocks its head, it cocks its head because it's not quite sure what you're saying. And by tilting its ears, it's actually clarifying the sound. So animals and humans often do things physiologically to, to try and clarify what they're seeing or hearing. And you can do this neurologically as well. You're sort of magnifying the difference between these two. If this is slightly higher than this one, this means this one is slightly is inhibiting this one slightly more strongly than this one is inhibiting this one, right? So suddenly it cleans up the signal and says, I got it. The light is more over there, right? If the light levels are really close to one another, it's not sure, then this battle continues between the two. But eventually, one will win out 
which is usually the one closest to the flashlight. And that asymmetry will stay there even though the light disappears, right? It's holding the memory of which side the light is on. So this is one of the rare cases where we can actually look inside the brain of one of our robots and actually see the part of the brain that's computing some useful subfunction. Okay, all this buildup as usual for six unfortunately poor uh, images here. Again, 1997, not very good video capture back then. Uh, hopefully you can see what's going on here. Here's a physical T maze. They placed the physical Kepler robot up here, and they then had a little LED light, and they did some time-lapse photography. So as the robot was moving, it was dragging this light trajectory with it. It made sure that the robot could not see the LED on its back, right? That would sort of complicate things. This is a pretty dark room, which is good for the motion capture here, or the light capture, and also good for the robot. How did the robot do? Pretty good, right? You can actually see there are multiple lines in each image here, which is them picking up the Kepra, putting it back, and making sure that, in this case, the fact that it turned to the left was not just a coincidence, right? They took the same evolved controller, put the Kepra back at the base of the T, moved the flashlight to the other side, and the robot consistently turned to the same side. This is all results from all just one evolved controller. They took that evolved controller and now put it in this environment. What's happening now? They widen the corridor. They widen the corridor. Does the robot care? Not really, right? So it's robust to the width of the corridor. So evolution has clearly not exploited the fact that in the simulation, the corridor was always the same width because it wasn't. What's that? It definitely seems to be utilizing the width. Like in the first one, it's just like a first straight line. But as you go into thicker corridors, it has a thicker. It's got a thicker. There's more. It, maybe if you look carefully, I think they didn't always put the robot in the in the center at the beginning. So I'm not sure if that was the investigators or whether it was actually the the robot. What's different in this case? What did they do differently in figure number four here? They angled, they started the robot pointing a little bit to the right. And you can see the robot actually corrects itself. And it actually starts to jag a little bit to the right when it sees the light, which says maybe it's, again, using the fact that it's a body in an environment. What about this one? <clears throat> they refuse to angle it straight. Sometimes they put the robot facing a little bit to the right, sometimes a little bit to the left. What's going on in this case here? It's hard for me to see from this angle. Same thing. They actually turned up the lights in the room a little bit. It's also robust to ambient light overall. It probably wouldn't work in a fully lighted room, but this is a pretty robust robot. Right? Pretty simple task. Very, very simple simulation. But at least we have a robot that, in every case here, is doing the right thing. right? This gives me hope that someday I'll be willing to fly on a 747 that's been programmed by a genetic algorithm. Not yet, but there's, there's hope, right? That maybe we can evolve robust controllers. Okay, so that was the first attempt to cross the reality gap, which works, but it's got this problem that you need to use this very, very simple simulation, and we need to sort of noisify all these aspects of it doesn't seem like a very scalable solution when we have complex robots and complex environments and complex simulations. So let's move on now from the radical envelope of noise hypothesis to the Golem project. This turned out to be a pretty famous experiment. Let me actually start with slide number two here. This was published in Nature uh, magazine. Uh, the, the worldwide preeminent uh, scientific magazine out there. Um, it was picked up by the New York Times and was one of very few scientific experiments to make it to the front page 
of the New York Times. This is the one and only evolutionary robotics experiment to ever make it to the front page of the New York Times. So everyone in the field is very proud of this experiment. Uh, why did it make it to the front page? Because this is the, the Terminator, right? It's robots making robots making robots, or at least according to the media, this is what was going on. Uh, how did these scientists get robots to make robots to make robots? Well, one of the robots obviously was the robot, but the robot that made the robot was this newfangled thing called a 3D printer, which no one had heard about in August of 2000. This was the beginning of the 3D printing era. This was the experiment that sort of lit the, the fire. Right? Okay, uh, this was work carried out by uh, Hod Lipson at Cornell. I worked with Hod for a couple years after this experiment. Hod told me he was inspired by this cartoon, which actually came from a NASA technical report back in the 80s, right? So NASA realized way back in the 80s, actually back in the 60s, they realized they were never going to be able to send, to package up 10,000 robots and send them to the moon or Mars or wherever and have those 10,000 robots build a colony on that planet. What they were going to have to do sometime in the future was design a robot that once it got to the planet, a few robots that once it got wherever it was, would either mine raw materials or somehow build a copy of itself and the copy would build a copy and the copy would build a copy, right? Send self-replicating machines to another planet and let them build the 10,000 there rather than all the expense and complexity of building them all of them here on Earth and getting them there. So the Golem project was an attempt to try and do this where the idea would be someday instead of sending a robot to another planet, we would send a 3D printer, and that 3D printer would somehow get material from the planet and start to print 3D robots in situ, on site. That's the, the basics of the Golem project. So step one, evolve the robot uh, to locomote in simulation, much like we've seen many times before by now. In this case, they evolve both body and brain. We've seen that a couple times now. We're going to see many more examples of that in this last part of the, the course. Evolve bodies and brains of simulated robots. Manufacture the robot using a 3D printer. Um, and in the Golem project, this was using the first generation of 3D printers, which could print only plastic. So you'll, I'll show you some of those in a moment. They were basically printing connected hollow tubes and you would then snap inside these hollow tubes motors and electronics and all these other things that you, that you needed. Right? Now we're entering uh, a phase of 3D printing where we can now start to print not just plastics, but we can also print ceramics inside those plastics. And we're starting to get to the point where we can print multiple kinds of metals inside the same structure. So no one has printed no one has yet 3D printed a robot that walks out of the 3D printer, but we're getting really close. It's going to happen any time now. Okay. Back then, they were just printing sort of these plastic uh, models. Okay. So if we're going to try and snap everything we need inside these hollow tubes, then we need to evolve robots that have bodies made up of connected hollow tubes like you can see here. So the robot is made up of these hollow tubes, and then we have some neural network here, which is sending commands to the motors. The motors are a little bit different than what we've seen before. So what we do is we take one of these uh, hollow plastic tubes, cut it in half, and put a linear actuator inside that pulls the two halves towards one another or pushes them away from one another. So not unlike a piston, right? So these robots move then by lengthening or shortening a subset of their, uh, of their cylinders. Okay. Let's have a look at how these robots were evolved first. This shows the genotype. And you can ignore this question here. I had to cut out some material from the lecture. We didn't cover developmental mapping, so just ignore this for now. What does the genotype look like? In your project, your genotype is a four times eight matrix because you're just evolving the body, or the brain of your robot. If we want to evolve the body and the brain, we're going to have to make the genotype a 
little more complex. The genotype is organized as a set of nested lists. The main list called robot is a list that is made up of four lists, vertices, bars, neurons, and actuators. Vertices, uh, the vertices list is made up of, again, a set of uh, tuples here, a set of triples, x, y, z's, which define that list defines basically the connection points for all of the cylinders. Okay. The next list called bars is made up of a series of one, two, three, four, uh, uh, a four, uh, four, uh, four tuple, which is take the, an index of one vertex and specify the vertex, uh, or index of another vertex, define that these are connected by a cylinder. And then we see that the cylinder has two additional properties attached to it, relaxed length and stiffness. Where have you heard of these two properties before? Is that going back to like that tensegrity robot? Absolutely. This actually is like a tensegrity robot. And the, these robots were the inspiration for the tensegrity project. But that's not where we saw uh, relaxed length. I think the last time we saw it, we called it rest length and stiffness. The bipedal robot, remember the passive dynamic walker that was walking down the decline? What, what, what were those two parameters associated with? The springs, right? So if we cut this tube in half, we can attach it with a spring. And that spring has a rest length, which means the default length that the cylinder likes to be. And if for some reason, when this thing is moving, these two halves get pulled apart from one another, how much do they resist that pulling apart or that pressing together, that stiffness? A spring that has infinite stiffness is just a metal rod, right? You can't, you can't lengthen a red metal rod or compress it, right, or not very easily. Right? Okay, so there's a little bit of springiness in some of these uh, cylinders. We then have uh, our, a list of neurons. These neurons, each neuron has a threshold and a synapse coefficient, a, a list of synapse coefficients of connections to all other neurons. A bit of a mouthful. What, is that, what does that mean? Well, in the little cartoon here, you can see the neural network sort of floating outside the body of the robot. So we define a neuron here. So one element in the neurons list is a neuron. It has a threshold associated with it. Remember, the threshold has to do with the activation function. And assuming there are a bunch of other neurons in the, in the neural network have already been defined, there is a set of synapse coefficients, or as we know them, synaptic weights, n1, n, n here, a set of synaptic weights that connects that new neuron n to all the other neurons that have already been made. So for every element in the list neurons, if we have n neurons, each of those n neurons connects to all the other uh, neurons. In this case, it do, the neurons do not connect to themselves. You don't see these little self loops. Yeah? Okay. What about an actuator? We have a list of actuators, and in that list of actuators, there are a set of elements. Each element is called actuator. So the first value in an element picks a bar. So let's say we pick this bar, this cylinder. We pick a neuron index. Let's say we pick this neuron. And the, we connect then this neuron to this bar. That's what the actuator does. And this bar range. So you can think about this as how much the, this neuron is going to try and ex extend the length of this bar or compress it. Right? You remember with your hinge joints, you specified the minimum rotation angle and the maximum rotation angle. Same thing here for bar range. So every element actuator picks a bar, connect, picks a neuron, and connects that neuron to the bar. And so now, if this robot is actually 3D printed, 
this bar is going to be cut in half, and it's going to lengthen and shorten according to the values that arrive here. If a negative value arrives here, what do you think the motor tries to do to the bar? Contract it. If a positive value arrives at this neuron, it tries to lengthen the length of the bar. Pretty straightforward. What are we missing? You all know what the basic building blocks of robots are. There's something that's missing. Sensors. No, that's right. So no sensors here. It's a lot going on. They said, let's just forget the sensors. We're just going to have a robot that evolved to blindly produce some oscillatory pattern. Right, so no, no sensors here. OK. Um, how did they evolve things? Well, they had a population of initially null genotypes, which means each of uh, the robot uh, list here was composed of four null lists. No actuators, no bars. No actuators, no bars, no neurons, no synapses, no nothing. Kind of a strange way to start. Fitness, as we've seen many, many times before, displacement of the center of, max, uh, of the mass. And the evaluation period is a fixed number 12 of cycles of neural control. So I put question mark here, because that should immediately raise a flag in your mind that there's something else that's obviously in this model that they neglected to mention. what produces regular cycles or regular oscillations. We don't have any sensors here, so it's not the sensors. What produces a regular gait in you when you walk out of this classroom? The central pattern generators, right? So they forgot to mention it, but probably there's one special neuron in here somewhere that is just emitting a sinusoidal pattern. Right? They just forgot to mention it. OK, must be there because that's what they're talking about, cycles of neural control. OK, so we start with these null, uh, these null genotypes, and then they define nine different mutation operators. So whenever a robot produces an offspring, they introduce one or more of these nine mutations. One of them is applied to each newly created genome. Here's a little cartoon to show you subsequent mutations. Here's our null robot, right? So a robot that has nothing. Suddenly, this robot produces a child that is non-null. Which of these nine mutations produced this from this? Change the length of a bar. Yeah, exactly. So. Let's assume that the null robot has a single bar of length zero, for example. OK, turn to your neighbor and work your way through this mutation, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Which mutation operator from this list, list produced the K plus 1 robot from the KF1? See if you can talk it through. I'll give you two minutes to do that, and then we'll see what you came up with. Sorry, 10 different mutations. Is the 
difference between uh, the, the fifth and the fourth? Is that a different size? Or between is that this one and this one? No, the, that one and the next one. Between this one and this one? Yeah. Is that the different size bar, or is it just rotated so you can see? Not quite. Got a, it's not a perfect cartoon. Okay, I can say this because I know these co-authors pretty well. They weren't 100% accurate in the description of everything in this, this paper. So you may have noticed that some of these steps, there was more than one mutation per, per step. They tried to create this cartoon to sort of show you intuitively what's, what's going on. Okay, let's try and uh, let's do it here. So from the null to the non-null was mutation one. What about from this one to this one? One, right? This one to this one? One and five, add an unconnected neuron. Oh, and I forgot to mention the percentages are the probability that that mutation would occur. Right? So for example, changing the length of a bar tended to happen much more often than adding or removing a neuron. Okay, so mutation one and mutation five, what mutation operations occurred here? One for sure and five. Add an unconnected neuron, exactly, which is this one. Whenever you add uh, an unconnected, sorry, it's this one here. Whenever you add a new neuron, remember if we go back to the neurons list, you add a new neuron element here. When you add it, you give it a random threshold and you give it random synaptic weights to connecting it to all the other neurons, which at this point in this little cartoon progression is just one other neuron, right? So you create this new neuron and it connects to this one with a random weight. What happens here? Split bar into two and add a vertex. Yeah, so you can see this bar was split uh, in two and we add a vertex here. There's another bar behind it. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not the operation. What's that? It's actually, uh, it's actually, where is it here? It's this one, number seven. So we take this vertex, split it into two vertices, these two, and connect those two new vertices with a small bar, which is this small bar here. That's quite so obvious, right? Okay. And something else happened. There's a mutation to this connection here. Okay. This one, from, he from here to here, you can see that this bar, is, this one is, uh, where is it here? Split bar into two, right? Number eight. Split this bar into two and add a vertex in the center. You get the idea, right? So we've got these mutation operators which can take an initially null robot and gradually complexify the body and or the brain of the robot over time. Okay, here were the numbers that I came up with. I'm not sure if that's what we actually said, but you can figure it out on your own. Okay, now for the fun part. We got one minute left. Here are samples from one generation. So we're looking across the population. So 15 plus 12 here, we're looking at 27 different robots. You can see that they all have different bodies, and you can be sure they all have different uh, brains. I will save the videos of some of these robots for next Tuesday. Um, you have a quiz due tonight. Uh, Sam will be walking you through his experiments in Evolved Soft Robots on Thursday, and we will talk about Assignment 10 on Tuesday when I bribe you with some food from either D.C. or San Francisco. Have a good weekend.